And then what happens to you when you're in graduate school in physics, you get deliberately discouraged from engaging with philosophical questions. Okay, so welcome everyone who is listening. So this is one more uh, dialogue on the foundations, uh, an initiative of the Center for Advanced Studies in Munich, uh, in which uh, uh, physicists and philosophers will talk about issues that, uh, first of all, interest them, and uh, second, they are relevant for the foundations of physics, either from the physics side or from the philosophy side or both. And it is my uh, great pleasure to have here uh, Jenan Ismail, who is a philosopher at John Hopkins University. And uh, can you uh, introduce yourself a bit and tell us what a bit more about you? Sure. Um, I'm a, uh, just as you said, I'm a philosopher at Johns Hopkins University. I'm the William H. Miller III Professor of Philosophy. I've just moved to Johns Hopkins. I was at Columbia before. Um, and yeah, I'm interested in lots of issues in foundations of physics. I think more than many philosophers of physics, I'm a philosopher first. So I'm interested in kind of the central problems in philosophy, but ones that intersect with physics. And I tend to think that um, you cannot answer those questions without thinking about physics. So what is space and time? What are we? What is our place in the cosmos? And I guess that explains why you 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 talk to me as well, because uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm a theoretical physicist uh, uh, with only you know interest in philosophy, but not I'm not a professional philosopher, and I work at the Arnold Sommerfeld Center in Munich, uh, and uh, I'm the coordinator of this uh, initiative of, on foundations of physics of the Center for Advanced Studies. So let, let's start. Let me start with the, with the very first thing you said. In fact, uh, you know, I know uh, and many philosophers of physics, and many of them are uh, good friends. You are one of them, but you are peculiar. Because uh, um, many of the philosophers of physics I know uh, don't really are not that interested in a lot of the typical questions of uh, philosophy having to do, for example, with metaphysics, uh, with, uh, you know, this sort of uh, purely philosophical issues. They are philosophers of physics uh, to some extent because they are interested in physics and they want to understand better what physics has to say. But you are uh, a, a philosopher, period. And that happens to be interested in physics for what it has to say about philosophy. But uh, uh, can you say more about how you see the relation between physics and philosophy from your perspective? Right. Um, so I'll back up a bit. I mean, I think that you know, philosophy is a big umbrella, and philosophers of physics are a kind of big umbrella. As you say, there are many people who are some of them who have PhDs who end up in philosophy departments because they're interested in foundational questions. But many of them are interested in internal problems for physics, where physics is bumping up against questions that the sort of fills, the sort of training that philosophers have tends to be useful. So they get into deep questions about whether space and time, for example, questions in foundations of quantum mechanics that require a kind of logical analysis rather than simple calculation. Um, but then there are the types of of philosophers of physics that are more like me, where you start out interested in philosophical questions, but um, you find, so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into philosophy of physics. So I actually went to graduate school in philosophy without, without having a deep philosophical background. I started philosophy in my last year in college, so going to, but I loved it. Um, Going to um, I spent a couple of, uh, one in one year actually in graduate school and got acquainted with what was at the time um, the standard way of doing philosophy. So people were there's a lot of armchair exploration of questions like you know what is the basic structure of the universe? What are, what is it made of? How do we fit into it? Um, what is space? What is time? And can I be uh, politically incorrect and say that this is exactly the type of philosophers that physicists tend to hate? 
And right. There's a type of philosophers that convince physicists that uh, they don't need to listen to what philosophers do and, and say because they have nothing to teach them. It's a... Uh, I don't so think that's how, but I, I, that's no, no, I, this is the this exactly how I felt. I mean, that was exactly, you know, um, and then I wandered into, I mean, it, and then the way that it's, I feel it's politically wrong for me to be saying these kinds of things, but I'll tell you why I do. Don't worry, this is being recorded. <laughs> okay. But it was exactly how I started to feel. You know, people are, are sitting in the armchair and the standard for the correctness of a, of a theory. So you systematize your intuitions about something like space and time, free will, uh, causality. Um, and then you, the standard, then there are a bunch of different ways of, of saying what, you know, sort of systematizing the intuitions, metaphysical theories, and the standard for the, the betterness of a theory is how well it does at systematizing your intuitions. Um, and there's a lot of give and take, pros and cons. And I wanted into, and it, and it starts to feel like you're not getting traction in what the universe says about these things. Wandered into a um, seminar taught by someone just out of graduate school. I was at graduate school at Princeton. David Lewis was kind of the big uh, metaphysical philosopher, amazing person, um, but you know, practicing philosophy in very much that sort of armchair tradition. Um, and Martin Jones said the first young philosopher, fresh out of graduate school, said the first day of the seminar, I was just shopping around like you do for seminars, said, I'm going to prove this theorem. The theorem is going to rock your world, basically. It's going to show you that all your most basic intuitions about the universe are wrong. And my thought was, yeah, okay, I've seen arguments before. They all have premises. Your choice at the end of the argument is to accept or reject, you know, one of the premises or accept the conclusion. Um, and he put Bell's theorem. Um, and it really did. I mean, that, you know, it really did rock my world in the sense of, um, it wasn't just about accepting or rejecting premises. It was deep and important, and it seemed to me to show immediately that um, there wasn't a question of preserving your most basic intuitions about the world. And I immediately wanted to know more. Um, and I think what the difference between the way that I now see philosophers in the more traditional armchair metaphysics um, you know, that, that sort of practice. And what physics is doing is it's actually continuous. I mean, I think, you know, what you can think of your folk, your, your sort of intuitions as doing is, you know, they systematize um, sort of uh, regularities in the world, more or less at the level that common sense interacts mm -hmm. with it. Um, it, you know, people in the grand tradition in physics, like Plato and Aristotle, they were sort of scientists. They were looking around. They were trying to understand what the basic structure of the world is. What, um, but but they had you know bits of experience, um, and it was a single imagination that was doing work to try to 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 you know come up with a system that reg that that codified those regularities and made sense of a unified framework that made sense of what they saw. Um, can, I, can I interrupt you? Uh, so I, I want to, uh, at some point to, I mean, soon uh, to, to, to go back to the actual physics itself and, uh, and the philosophy of physics and your work. But what, what you say prompted me to ask something else, your opinion about something else, which is uh, why and when this, the split occur between physics and philosophy and, and then I have a comment about Bell's theorem uh, that, that you that, that you raised but uh, what, what's your take on that why is it that now everything is still rather split it's a good question I mean part of it is sociological but part of it is so what you know what physics does is it gives us you know I mean it, it's continuous with philosophy but it depends so 
what physics does better is it it's no longer just simple regularities that common sense you know um, and, and it's no longer a single imagination we have a large body of incredibly detailed carefully regulated carefully and precisely measured data and um, what physics has done is not just the work of one imagination it's the work of generations of physicists building on what went before them. It's now much too complicated for uh, someone to understand without a lot of training. But then the uh, knowledge is so specialized by now that it's very hard to stay on, on top of the, both the conceptual, technical, observational, physical aspect of the of what physical theories have to say. And so it's difficult to really maintain a strong philosophical understanding and inquiring uh, attitude uh, while at the same time controlling the technical aspects and the the deep content of the physical theories that's exactly right and i mean i think the the in order to get the kind of training you need to understand um physics it very often you make a choice early on you know to be a physicist and then what happens to you when you're in graduate school in physics you start learning not just you know sort of what are you know uh, what is the face base of the theories you're interested in. you 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 learn a lot of tricks about how to calculate how to solve problems you get quickly deflected away not just deflected away but deliberately discouraged from engaging with philosophical questions mm -hmm. philosophers on the other hand you know they they are interested in the big questions they um, but the kind of training they get doesn't equip them once they're in, you know, once they're professional philosophers, to be engaging seriously with physics. So I think what happens is just the split occurs partly is just a function of, of um, education. And then you're socialized into, you know, the, the setting that you're in. You want to please your friends. You want to be able to talk to your colleagues. So if you're a physicist, you're not um, except at the bar after after um, you know, sort of after the conference, actually asking philosophical questions. And if you're a philosopher, you know it's it, um, there's a lot of you know trying to protect for themselves. I think a um, a setting in which they have something to offer. Yeah. So the moment uh, I would I would say that the moment uh, the how to say very concrete difficulties in, in talking across communities uh, uh, are in place uh, and communities with, with different tools, uh, different trainings form, uh, then somehow things crystallize a bit and it becomes a self-reinforcing uh, uh, mechanism in which you, know, you stay within your community. In order to stay within the community, you should maximize the time you spend within the community talking to each other. It becomes very risky on top of being very difficult to try to reach out to other communities. In fact, it's, it's true even within the community of physicists uh, in different subfields and within different subfields, uh, depending on different schools of thought uh, and uh, and so on. So it's, I understand. Okay, let me let, let me move slowly uh, with one further digression, but because you raised a number of things in your briefest courses in uh, on, on your past uh, that 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 there is one other digression that I want to make, uh, but I want to move slowly towards uh, foundations of physics and, and starting from quantum mechanics that you uh, already mentioned. You mentioned Bell's theorem, and and the, for, and, and the point is that uh, Bell's theorem uh, is also from the physics side the 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 first example or the most powerful tool that I would use uh, if I had to convince. Uh, uh, that I use when I have to convince physicists that, that uh, I'm sorry, you had to think about the philosophical questions and you had to talk to the philosophers who are specialized in that. Uh, uh, how much you learn from them uh, depends on the philosopher you talk to, but, uh, but the fact that there are issues in physics, even technically phrased, rigorous theorems, uh, you know, uh, with experimental tests and, and, uh, and recent Nobel Prizes, and that, that, you know, have to do with philosophical issues, so uh, it's a fact. And this is the example. Uh, and uh, so, that, 
I'll go there, and but now I, uh, another digression come, comes to mind. I mean, <laughs> we will never get there. But the, uh, the the other digression is that the attitude that, that you seem to voice, in which uh, yeah, the philosopher has to anyway take uh, care and look carefully at what physicists uh, do and physical theories that you say about the world and and so on, and possibly some some training there. Uh, uh, is this what people call a naturalist? stance in, in philosophy? Does it have to do with what people call naturalized uh, metaphysics or naturalized philosophy? It certainly has to do with what was in, in a few centuries ago, uh, natural philosophy that was the name of physics. I mean, or what? That's right. <laughs> but it, does yeah. that work also on the philosophy side that it's a, it's a specific way of understanding how you should do philosophy or, or a misunderstanding totally the way the term is used? The term is used in a lot of different ways. I mean, uh, but uh, it, this, yeah. certainly the way that I think of it um, is that you think that physics, physics and science in general, is authoritative about the physical world. And that, um, you know, the attitude towards, for example, intuitions and the pure light of reason um, is uh, that, that is that some parts of philosophy hold is uh non i mean it's it's not the right way to think of it that you know what we know about the physical world we know from experience uh the status of intuitions we are natural things in a natural world the status of intuitions and the penetrability of the universe to reason um is only you know insofar as it's supported by thinking of ourselves as natural things embedded in the natural world. Mm -hmm. so um you look to science you look to science to tell us um what the it's not that science is infallible it's not that experience is anything more than um you know sort of a source of information about the world and one that's subject to all of the um you know sort of all of the doubts and all of the trouble that um, ordinary physical channel, but it is our only source of information about form. Mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the the I think the naturalist stance. We're natural things in a natural world. We know about the world through empirical channels, experience, and the best that we can do is to look to science to tell us what the world is like. Okay, of course, that's uh, just to reassure my other friends, uh, philosophers, that uh, not necessarily share this enthusiasm for physics. It, of course, doesn't imply that uh, you take what physicists say at, at face value, because that's exactly where further reflection, critical reflection has to come in. And I can say, I can speak in first person that a lot of physicists have very low level uh, um, uh, of, uh, very low level of uh, the I would say, uh, not really knowledge is uh, that thing in thinking about the subtleties, conceptual subtleties and so on. So sometimes the, the view they present, the, even when it's about their own uh, results or their own theories and what they mean, uh, uh, do not, does not stand any critical examination. Uh, if you go a little bit deeper at the conceptual level, sometimes you feel, well, this is a bit of a naive way of posing the the, the understanding the issue, uh, even the physical one. Uh, so. but, you know, I think I, the so I want to go back to to the relationship between physicists and philosophers, if that's okay. I mean, I think so. One of the beauties of physics is that, and science in general, is that it's the best example of a truly kind of collective epistemic exercise. Meaning, it's a truly collective attempt. To understand the world, so um, because of that, I, I mean, I think um, for me, even though there's a lot of hostility between physics and philosophy, and we've already talked about things that we think, you know, prejudices about right ways of doing, I think there's room for everyone. So you know, there's a lot of physicists um, who are primarily interested in elaborating um, a formal system, doing calculations, working within a framework to deliver solid results based on first principles that they're taking for granted. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a philosophy of physics wouldn't get off the ground 
unless we had a lot of people doing exactly that. The, the people who are, who are interested in foundations and they're, and, you know, huge parts of physics are doing just exactly that. But physics, as you said, does bump up against questions, places where it absolutely demands the kind of careful, you know, kind of analytic attention to fundamental concepts, reorganization of first principles and so on. And that's the sort of sweet spot where I think philosophers and physics come together in a productive way. Um, and I think the same, you know, philo you know, there's lots of parts of philosophy that don't inquire, don't, don't really require technical engagement with foundations of physics. So I think it's just, um, you know, the, the, there isn't really a normative obligation for most physicists to pay attention to foundations, and there's not really a normative obligation for most philosophers to care that much about physics. But there are parts where, you know, it does need the, 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 the type of training that both of us are on. Um, to, 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 again, to, to, to clarify further, the point is that's true even within the disciplines. So yeah. with, with physics is such a complex enterprise that uh, luckily me working in uh, quantum gravity uh, has, has no uh, uh, obligation, luckily, again, to, to be extremely well versed and have a deep understanding of the details of experiments that are done, uh, I don't know, in, in condensed matter or particle physics, uh, let alone, and in, in fact, not even those about quantum gravity phenomenology. Uh, the, uh, I mean, there are people who are, they would be always much better than me at producing new knowledge in those uh, subdomains. Uh, and so I just had to understand roughly what they're doing and, and their knowledge. Uh, their importance mm -hmm. and, and i would say that the same applies uh, to to the you know the overlap between physics and philosophy i mean a lot of physicists will not care and they don't need to they they just need to acknowledge that uh, on a cultural level that there is that sort of uh, overlap and it has some mm -hmm. value then they work on whatever they want they don't want to have anything to do with that because but they don't like it, that, that's fine. And the same is true for philosophers on, on the other side. Um, anyway, sorry, this is... Uh, uh, let me close the digression. Uh, and uh, and uh, let's say something about, indeed, uh, the topic of foundations of quantum mechanics that we touched upon uh, already. You, you, you mentioned Bell's theorem, and, and you've done a lot, uh, some very interesting work that, 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 that I liked uh, um, about uh, how we should... In, understand entanglement, which is somehow one of the key features of uh, uh, quantum mechanics and, uh, and and it's central in Bell's theorem and, and all of that. So let me first say, so um, there is a naive way of, uh, of phrasing what entanglement is, which is just to say that uh, what um, pairs of systems in quantum mechanics or quantum systems, uh, somehow if they interacted, uh, at some point in the past, uh, they uh, they remain uh, always uh, related to one another, uh, unless you know the new things uh, takes place. But in general, even if they keep living their life, uh, so to speak, uh, then they remain uh, related. Um, so that uh, you can say that the world uh, is uh, entirely non-local because uh, you know things interact and then they go to the opposite ends of the universe and they are still related to one another and the properties of one depend on the properties of the other and so that uh, one way to present the story of Bell's theorem which is uh, one way in which this has been formalized uh, is that uh, well the world is non-local we learned that and and the physicists that uh, go to the training they they come they learn that uh, but then they have all sorts of other courses in which uh, uh, the principle of locality of interactions and and uh, evolution and so on is extremely is, is central everywhere so uh, you know and so i think people become totally schizophrenic in their understanding of what, what, what's really going on and, and to uh, to some extent this has to do with the the way education works, so that you know, sometimes uh, you know you do hear contradictory uh, stories uh, 
to some extent is instead the fact that uh, there are different views uh, on, on what entanglement really means, uh, what, uh, what, what are the lessons of quantum mechanics, uh, what are the lessons of Bell's theorem, how we should interpret those results. And this uh, uh, straightforward non-local explanation is, of course, one of the possibilities. Uh, but somehow the, the, the way the world is non-local, even in that sense, is not the same as this world of the, the idea of non-locality is understood in, uh, I don't know, classical physics uh, uh, and, 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 and my understanding is that uh, Bell's theorem is at the same time, if not, first of all, uh, a call to question uh, any naive uh, understanding of uh, how we represent reality, how, how our models uh, reflect uh, what's really going on in the world. And what's your view? I mean, um, it, first of all, did I summarize the, the story okay? I mean, would add whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. So I want to um, say a couple of things. One is, you know, you're right that, that part of what happens is people are working with a, fra a framework for thinking in one area and a framework for thinking of an in, in another area. The two frameworks are incommensurable, but so long as the problems that they're working on um, don't bring them into, you know, sort of don't, don't create a clash by forcing them to try to combine frameworks, they're fine. And I think what, what when you start to raise the question about, yes, but what's really going on here? one reaction that people can have is to turn sort of instrumentalist or quasi-instrumentalist and say, it doesn't matter, the framework works over here and the framework works over there, and I can't see a problem where, or a calculation that requires both the philosophical attitude or the kind of the realist stance, and I think this is the mark of the person who's kind of a natural, uh, who's, who's working in physics, but is a natural philosopher, um, is that they say, no, I want to know what's really going on. The world has one story, and I want to know what that story is. And I'm doing physics partly because I'm I'm looking at the phenomena and I'm calculating problems partly because I want to know what the world is really like. And if you start with that attitude, then you do need a single consistent story. And um, this was very much, of course, Einstein's attitude. What I think what what he thought locality showed was it made you, and these are the parts in you know, these are the moments in physics where it turns deeply philosophical, was it makes you start to question your most fundamental assumptions about the world. He said, yeah, sure, we're using spatiotemporal notions, and it's kind of built into the very foundation of spatiotemporal notions mm -hmm. that to use, a, you know, his own, um, kind, his own sort of phrases for this is that things are located in space, and insofar as they're located in distinct points of distinct regions or distinct points of space. They're distinct things. And the only way that they interact with one another is by signals that pass through the space between them. You cannot take, if that's the way you're thinking, you ca cannot take a spatiotemporal framework and just add locality into it, non-locality into it, without undoing the framework, without, without unraveling the basic assumptions that are organizing your idea of things and distinctness and and relatedness in space. So that's what Einstein thought. I mean, he didn't know about Bell's theorem, but he thought we couldn't just add non-locality into it. We needed, if we were going to hang on to the spatiotemporal framework, we needed a way of reconstructing the kinds of connections that the quantum formalism um, uh, tells us are there between separated particles in a way that allowed us to talk about signals passing through space and so on. So that's why Bell's theorem, um, had he known about it, would have, I think, challenged his um, his his commitment to the spatiotemporal framework. Mm -hmm. I see. So for you, the the, the main message is that uh, um, you 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 cannot use. Uh, um, independent notions of space and time to distinguish and separate uh, physical systems somehow you know quantum mechanics uh, forbids you from 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 doing that i mean uh, things that uh, according to this extra structure which is space time that you take for granted and you use it to separate things to distinguish them 
uh, uh, it's it's you know uh, it will still be related to one another this, despite of that. And it's not the same. Somehow it's not the same notion of non-locality in uh, like in Newtonian uh, mechanics, in which two things act at distance to one another. It's more uh, uh, the the. I mean, you're questioning somehow. The lesson is that uh, your very starting point that you have two separate things, and then you ask, uh, and you then they're separate because they are in different locations. We ask you to the your notions of space and time. Um, once you define them as separate, that you ask whether they act on to one another. This is the you know already misplaced as a type of uh, region already. Um, so. This is the philosopher's attitude, which, as you say, it raises questions because this is what you, it raises questions about what to do here because you say, well, what do you mean by a thing exactly? So our ordinary ways of thinking sort of built, you know, into kind of common sense, but also carried over very naturally and made, uh, you know, sort of precise in an Italian framework is you say, what do I mean by a thing? A thing is an object, it has its own fund of properties. Another thing is an object, it has its own fund of properties. The properties of this thing depend on the properties of this thing, only kind of extrinsically, and we've got physical mechanisms for saying how they can affect one another. Okay. That, you can't take that whole fund of notions and uh, hang on to, yeah, and, and simply add non-locality into it. So, for example, you know, you usually think, well, if I have a thing over here, um, I can test the properties of the thing by putting something into interaction with it and letting it affect, you know, sort of a measuring device, or I can go over and look at it. And I know that the way it affects me tells me something about it. But now in quantum mechanics, you can't depend on that way of thinking. Why is that? Because What's going on over here can be affected immediately by something going on as far away as you please. I can't shield myself from the effects of it. And so, so lots of ways of, of thinking experimentally, lots of ways of thinking conceptually really depend on the idea that when you've got a thing located in this region of space, um, that, uh, you know, you, you can find out about it by interacting with it, and you're not, you know, you can shield out the effects of other things. Mm -hmm. So that, when that goes out the window, then everything is kind of up for grabs again. So that's why I meant to say, well, what do we mean by thing? What is the, you know, what, uh, can we localize something in space? How does it interact with other things? There's a whole cluster of assumptions built into practices and built that, you know, practice experimental practices and ways of reasoning that really depends um, on locality, inexplicit and sort of tacit, but that once you start add non-locality in, they're threatened and you have to rethink the whole package. But the point is that they, this, uh, this way of understanding non-locality is, is a challenge to our definition of things. And, uh, rather than, uh, uh, I mean, because there are other, other ways, there are many ways in which people react uh, and try to incorporate some form of non-locality in, uh, in physics uh, following, uh, you know, the, the results in mm -hmm. mechanics and Bell's fields. And in some attempts, uh, you know, it, it, at least it seems to me that uh, people want to maintain a definition of uh, things uh, as, if it w as if we were still dealing with classical mechanics. Uh, you know, in which things have a position, they have uh, a velocity, or they have all sorts of stuff, and you add uh, some uh, non-local effect or some non-local correlations, uh, and, and trying to mimic uh, or, or in some case, modify, uh, but with the same non-local character, the, the 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 results of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that what you're saying is not in. I mean, this is somehow the direction taken by at least some uh, so-called hidden variable type uh, approaches. And what you say doesn't seem to go that way. It seems to, to go in, in, in rather in the direction of saying, yeah, that you can say that the world is no local, that the quantum world is no local, but not in the sense that there is uh, some 
weird force or some new type of uh, uh, correlation between uh, uh, individually, locally, spatial temporally identified uh, objects. Uh, and so things are no local in space time uh, is, is, is the very fact that you try to localize things in space time, which has to be questioned. Uh, That's right. And separate the uh, different parts of a composite system and, and so on is. Uh, Can I give you an everyday analogy that, so I, for me, it's helpful to think in concrete terms, is this beautiful analogy um, that comes from bone. Do, do you know this analogy of the fish tank? I may, I don't know, but uh, uh, whoever is listening probably doesn't. Okay. It's a, it, it's a very nice way of making the point that you should maybe start to question the idea of thing and start to question the idea that the fundamental particulars of the universe are localized in space rather than that we're seeing something like shadows in space of things that are loca localized in a deeper structure. Beautiful, very simple analogy. Um, he doesn't actually elaborate it as much as, as much as I think one might, but it will, you know, sort of make vivid this I, this movement to starting to question space, space as a fundamental structure. He says, imagine that you have a fish tank, and the fish tank has cameras. One camera is looking at the fish tank from the front. One camera is looking at the fish tank from the side. Um, in the fish tank, there's fish moving around, they're interacting, you know, sort of look. The, but there's someone in another room. And this person in another room or this being in another room knows nothing of the fish tank. In fact, they know nothing of rooms. What they are is they're sort of, you know, sitting in their, their, their sitting, but their experience is um, completely of a two-dimensional screen. And that's all they know. Their experience is this experience of a two-dimensional screen, and the screen has projected on one side the image that's being cast by the fish tank from the front, and on the other side, the image that's being cast by the, the, by the camera that's looking at the fish tank from the side. But they're sort of seamlessly integrated, so it's just a two-dimensional expanse. What is the person seeing? Think about this for a second. Well, they're seeing, you know, if they look at this side of the screen, they're seeing two-dimensional, you know, images of fish moving around and through, and everything looks fine and it looks local. And you know, they're seeing, you know, fish images, you know, changing shape and passing through a trajectory. And then they look over on this side of the screen, and they're seeing different images, you know, again. But if they're careful, they'll start to notice correlations between the events on two sides of the screen. Mm -hmm. So what are they going to see every time? A fish turns, um, you know, from the front to the side on this side of the screen. Remember, they're just thinking in two-dimensional terms. So they see an image change in this way. They see a corresponding and immediate change on this side of the screen over here. Every time they see an event or a movement on that side of the screen, they see a corresponding, uh, you know, movement over here. And they see these correlations between two sides of the screen with um, no apparent explanation in terms of one thing affecting the other. Moreover, they're immediate, they're instantaneous, they're inseparable in the sense that they can't, they can't talk about what's happening over on the side of the screen without having implications. So, you know, the, the kinematical constraints on relationships between kinematical, non-dynamical constraints. So you might think, well, what do they do? They try to kind of fill in hidden influences, you know, between what's going on in the two sides of the screen. You can sort of replay in your mind the kinds of um, moves that um, philosophers and physicists reacting to non-locality have tried in ordinary three-dimensional space. So we know because of the way the thing that was set up, oh, well, it's obvious what's going on here. There's a single fish that's casting images on two sides of the screen. But the actual dynamics is happening in three space, and you, I mean, there's there there are no dynamical influences passing through, affecting, you know, passing through the two dimensional expanse and stuff. As soon as you start thinking in that way, you start saying, "Oh, yes, of course, the whole cluster of problems mm -hmm. um, in quantum mechanics, the expectation that there should be locality in three space." 
um, comes from an assumption that thinks that the fundamental particulars are lo localized in space. There, there are two points here. Let me see if uh, if if I can uh, use them to 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 move further. So, uh, one is in the example the fact that uh, uh, what was seen as uh, two different uh, objects uh, in principle independent uh, because they were on in different points in space, you know, one side the other, where in fact uh, well in the example is it was in fact the same fish you would say. But in general, is this sort of a, is a single system that uh, you appear to you know determine some of its properties looking somewhere and some other properties looking somewhere else. But in fact, uh, there is some inbuilt correlation, not an action of one system to the other, but there is a single system uh, that could admit a projection in two different places, so, so to speak. Uh, so. So this is a sort of uh, this goes in, in in the direction of what unfortunately in in many uh, new age type uh, crackpot like uh, um, outlets uh, on, on the web is called holism, which uh, taken seriously it's an amazing thing and and and, and properly defined as you did it's uh, it's I find it how to say well deep exciting even romantic. But uh, but uh, but uh, so maybe we we can spend a few more words on on, on that. Uh, the other aspect that I want also to to spend some uh, words on is the fact that uh, uh, also in your example, in the example you, you mentioned, this fact that we project things on two sides uh, is in fact uh, uh, um, a relational point about the observer I means the observer that uh, uh, you know in, in in his attempt to understand what system is 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 facing uh, or she's facing uh, then uh, uh, you know decides to use two screens and I know to uh, to try to to uh, use properties located somewhere and other properties located uh, somewhere else. So it seems to me that it brings another element into discussion, which is the role of uh, Whatever other system is playing the role of observer for uh, the the physical system described by your, uh, you know, in this case by quantum mechanics, uh, would you agree with that? That uh, you know there is also this part of the story, or um, okay, yes, I do, and I, you know, I was, I've come to think actually. So I used to think um, more along the lines of what I was just saying, which is that we should think of ourselves as interacting with systems through physical channels and try to reconstruct, you know, from deeper principles that preserve locality in some more fundamental space, all of our experience without the assumption that what we're seeing in three space is distinct particulars insofar as they're located in different parts of space. But I now think that actually that um, a stance that takes very seriously that quantum mechanics tells us that we cannot stabilize the properties of objects independent of our interactions with them might throw that whole project into uh -huh. disarray or question. So, so um, if one focuses on that part of quantum mechanics, and if you say, let's think about quantum mechanics as um, telling us that every attempt to ascertain the properties, so you focus on what's called the measurement interaction, or you focus on any kind of exchange where we try to get information from a quantum system. And the quantum formalism itself tells us that whatever happens in those interactions does not support inferences to the properties of the object that you were interacting with either before the interaction or independently of the interaction the, the exchange that that interaction so the or i mean this is a sort of uh, a different way of thinking but you take the quantum formal a different approach you take the quantum formalism and you ask you know what sorts of inferences can we make about um quantum uh systems at um what you realize is that you you run into no both theorems and so on as soon as soon as you try to 
import classical intuitions. Like when I carry out an observation or carry out a measurement, I can infer after the measurement that the property that I observed was there before and that was and was there independently of the measurement interaction. So the whole kind of set of noble theorems tells us those don't work. If you take that very seriously, uh -huh. and you say, okay, so any attempt to get information from a quantum system, if that's the place that you start, um, does not support those kinds of inferences, then it's, it, it seems to me now um, a serious worry that um, even talking about um, the world distinct from our experience, the attempt to stabilize the world independently of our interactions with it um, is problematic. So that, that's something that, in fact, I wanted to, to introduce earlier, mentioning uh, Bell's theorem. I hinted at that. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of people uh, that I know, um, even among physicists, uh, take as the main lesson of, of, of Bell inequality and Bell's theorem and entanglement and quantum mechanics more generally, uh, that uh, what is really being challenged uh, is the very idea that, you know, there is a world out there that uh, we simply unravel the uh, properties of systems by just looking carefully into them, but uh, uh, those properties are possessed by uh, objects and physical systems independently of whatever we do, whatever our mental cognitive uh, structures are and uh, our the concepts we use. Uh, and, and our interactions with, with them, uh, this is what is challenged. This is what uh, we are forced to revise and be more careful with. Yeah. So one way, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Is so one way of thinking, so I, like you, I, I react strongly against that way of thinking. But one, I mean, instinctively, so without, you know, but one way of thinking of it is it's actually not challenging that there's a world out there. It's forcing us to recognize that we are part of the world. So it's taking very seriously that the agent is embedded in the world in such a way that you can't think of measurement interactions as passive rather than to use a, you know, Wheeler's word, participatory. Uh -huh. So um, what an you know, I, I think you can be a realist about the world and take seriously that every interaction is 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 not you know uh, is 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 itself involved in creating the phenomenon that's being observed. Um, I think that's a very interesting way to go. So it's not that you're 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 not being realist. It's not, it's it's that you're taking very seriously that um, everything that happens in the world, including measurement interactions, are participating in the phenomenon being created. And in fact, I mean, this, time, this attitude uh, is sometimes called uh, uh, anti-realist, but I think indeed that, that this is a total misunderstanding. It's just a, a call for a more refined, uh, subtle, difficult, maybe, uh, notion of realism. I mean, nobody denies the world is out there. It's just that we are realizing that the way we attribute properties to to systems, uh, the way we, we, yeah, the way we interact with the world, even uh, from a more epistemological point of view, is is, is non-trivial. I mean, it, it, it's part of the world itself. Um, it, uh, now you are the philosopher, but a lot of other philosophers would come to my mind uh, as uh, you know somehow having hinted uh, at, at various steps or produced various steps in in this direction. But uh, I don't want to make a fool out of myself by citing philosophers in front of a philosopher. So mm. uh, th th let's say that there are many things I've read, uh, uh, possibly understanding only half of that uh, that uh, would would be in line with this. Uh, and uh, so the, the, this way we introduced another point. You mentioned agents. And uh, in, in this particular case, it was, uh, well, how to say, epistemic agents or, or cognitive uh, agents. I mean, I, or, uh, our experimentalist friends and to some extent indirect also as uh, on this side of the laptop, uh, theoreticians, I mean, uh, theoretical physicists. Uh, but, you know, the, and uh, so 
from what we said, it should be clear at least in what's in close general sense, uh, agents, observers uh, are uh, called uh, uh, to uh, the, to the no to the spotlight by quantum mechanics. Uh, but in fact, uh, you, you have worked on uh, the role of agents in a number of other uh, related, but in principle distinct uh, areas of physics and sciences. I mean, I, I mentioned only two. Uh, one is probabilities and uh, the nature of probabilities, and that is more directly related to quantum mechanics uh, because quantum mechanics has probabilities at the very core and it's intrinsically a probabilistic theory. Um, causality uh, it's it's more uh, uh, tricky. I would say I found it much more um, interesting and surprising because I didn't know about it to to call uh, agency as having a role in our notion of causality because uh, you know we have a notion of causality in classical physics uh, and so you know things there seems to be straightforward. Let, let's start from probabilities. Uh, the, the, so first of all, what is the issue about the what probabilities are, what the, the old debate? Uh, I, so I ask you to summarize in like 30 seconds or one minute, the, uh, you know, two, three centuries old the debate on the nature of probabilities. Yeah, I mean, it's, easy, it's actually easy to sort of in the very generally, to say there's a question about what probabilities are. Are they reflections of our degree of beliefs, or are they in the head? Do they reflect something about us? Or are they in the world? Do they reflect something about the world? Um, objectivists think there's something about the world. There are factual questions about what the probabilities of some event are. Um, people who, who are subjectivists about probability think, no, probabilities reflect something about our degree of confidence. That an event will take place. Quantum mechanics challenges the subjectivist idea because it seems to suggest we have a fundamental physical theory whose you know whose fundamental laws cite probabilities. Surely, when we're investigating probabilities, when we're confirming experiments, we're looking in the world. We're not looking at our degrees of belief. So um, that's my two sentence summary. Okay, and where is uh, the agency? Uh, where is agency entering the the, the debate, uh, the the story? Because one could say, indeed, uh, one was a full objectivist about probabilities and say, okay, I accept that the world is in some sense uh, probabilistic, mm -hmm. uh, meaning uh, it's not that things have a certain property, meaning uh, you know they they sit in a given position. Uh, or uh, they move at a certain velocity, or you know, it, it dies, uh, shows a particular phase uh, in the in the you know vertical direction. Um, but they have a tendency to do that uh, on occasions. And so, if I check uh, several times, uh, sometimes I will see one, sometimes the other. That that is an objective intrinsic property of the system. I have nothing to do with that. Uh, Good. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, so here's the way I think, I mean, I gave you a two sentence summary. So are the things in the world, are they in us? I think the right way to respond to all of this is to say, and this is why I like looking at these sorts of questions in the context of a regimented physical theory is because the, the dichotomy is, uh, the dichotomy breaks down entirely. You think of us as physical systems in the physical world forming opinions about the things that we see. And what you want is a story that tells you, I mean, all of the whole, you know, sort of stories. It starts from fundamental physics. It talks about the regularities that are produced, you know, sort of um, in measurement interactions. It talks about agents coupled with those interactions forming beliefs about them. You want to know in detail what's the external infrastructure in the environment, and you want to know how is the agent picking up information about that, and how is that being reflected in its beliefs. So to tell that whole story, you're going to have to talk about laws, you're going to have to talk about regularities, you're going to have to talk about statistics before you bring agents in. And then you're going to bring agents in, and you're going to start talking about beliefs and degrees of beliefs, and those things are going to be related. All of those layers are going to be related. Every step of that, you don't have the story about the probabilities until you have that whole story. Where you get, I mean, the question about where are the probabilities is a silly question. Are you know are are are, 
our antecedent ideas about probability aren't articulated enough to draw, you know, all of the distinctions that we need. They don't know certainly, you know, what it, what in 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 the kind of detail that physics gives us, you know, sort of what are the fundamental structures, what are the emergent structures. Mm -hmm. um, we use probabilities. Probabilities are tools for thinking, um, you know, that that people without acquaintance. Are, but the full story about probabilities requires an understanding from the fundamental level right up to the degree of belief um, so the, and the relationships between those layers, some of which is external, some of which is internal. Okay, so some, to some extent uh, the, the, the agency comes in uh, not necessarily as a, as a sort of the, the conclusion of uh, uh, some metaphysical reasoning that I you know you, you're thinking about the prob what problems are in an in abstract sense, uh, and then it turns out that they have to be necessarily defined in terms of some agent. But it, it seems to me more that uh, you're making first a methodological sort of step and you say, look, you know, in order to really understand probabilities, you have to realize that the, probability, the very notion of probability, objective or not, and the, the way we use it and so on is always part of some model of the world. And so uh, we, we everything has been uh, has to be understood in a, in a broader context, uh, and at least that's where A and C comes in. So I'm going to back up a little bit. So I, I said a lot more without filling up some of the background, but 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 I'm going to back up a little bit. And I'm okay, misunderstood. of a problem. Yeah, feel free to tell me if I misunderstood. There will not be a right. No, no, no. I'm just articulating a little of the things that I didn't say. So the notion of a probability. Um, actually, it's a formal notion. Anything that satisfies the probability axioms can count as a probability. There are all kinds of contexts in which we can assign numbers that obey the probability axioms. Some of them are purely statistical. We can use probabilistic notions just to describe pat statistical patterns in the world. We can also use probabilistic notions and the probability calculus um, to describe degrees of belief. So the notion of probability itself, it's a formal notion that has multiple and you know multiple uses and multiple interpretations, whereby interpretations, I mean assignments of, of so, some of which are to describe beliefs and some of which are to describe, you know, statistical patterns out in the world. So when you said, you know, the philosophical question about probability, people are very often, you know, thinking well, we have a fundamental physical theory that has these numbers that are called probabilities. What do the probabilities represent? Do they represent something in the world or do they represent something in us? And as an implicate, as a, a, you know, the, the implication of the question is partly, do we understand the quantum formalism as describing something in the world or do we understand it as a tool for guiding our beliefs or expectations about what we'll see at the end of experiments? So, so, you know, the, the notion of probability um, when it's raised in that context is, is a question, you know, that, that um, sort of, you know, people ask is it, are they subject or objective? They have that more specific question in mind. But the probability calculus, if you just ask what are probabilities, probabilities are anything that satisfies the probability calculus, has all sorts of uses in physics, in, in, you know, in describing credences or degrees of belief. Okay, so this in fact resonates with the number of uh, statements I've heard from uh, people working on, uh, you know, risk assessments and statistics, uh, and uh, and they say, look, I mean, I may have my opinion about what is the the definition or the interpretation of probability that best captures or is most general, but uh, many of them are not very keen on debating to some extent the issue uh, in, in, in an abstract sense because they would say yeah all of these definitions uh, are fine uh, in the appropriate context uh, the, the only bad thing you can do is to you know to try to apply uh, subjective uh, belief measure uh, notion of probability to you know relative frequencies you know, you do an experiment, you observe something, you throw a dice uh, a large number of times, uh, then you can count things uh, in a certain limit, uh, then the relative frequencies of a certain outcome satisfy, uh, you know, the probability axioms. 
Uh, and you try to recast all of that in the language of uh, degree of beliefs and credences. And, and I said, yeah, look, in that case, just use uh, the interpretation of probabilities as relative frequencies. Uh, in other cases, uh, you know, if you have a single instance of an observation, you simply cannot reproduce it, you cannot repeat it, uh, then uh, uh, it's not just that uh, the, the interpretation in terms of relative frequencies uh, um, is wrong in some abstract sense. You just cannot apply it there. It, it just, you have to capture some other aspect of uh, probabilistic reasoning. Uh, and uh, when That's right. I mean, the notion, what the question, but what are the probabilities really, is just not a good question. Um, okay. You can write down some axioms, anything that you want to assign, at, you know, as um, interpretation of the axioms, so long as it satisfies the axioms is fine. But doesn't this uh, go uh, a bit in the direction, however, of saying that uh, um, uh, notional probabilities are whatever they are in reality, and assume that, that the question makes any sense at all, uh, probabilities are in any case a tool for uh, uh, interacting with the world and, uh, and uh, modeling the world and so on. And so that's where, that's where agency comes in. I mean, there are tools of, uh, you know, agents uh, to, to interact with the world uh, and uh, there may be some underlying, uh, you know, reality or it is represented by our models, by our theories. But in any case, uh, you have to use the interpretation of this tool appropriate to the use of the tool you're making. I think that's right. Okay, I, I hit on the right one. I saw <laughs> the essentially old problem. Okay. Okay, cool. But now you're going to tell me that the same is true for causality. So causality, so it, no, it's a much more complicated story and a much more interesting one. I mean, I think a lot of people... I don't know, are, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a physicist, so I, with the, I'm, I'm naive about that. You know, classical physics, I'm a relativist. You know, I there are... Uh, Let's say, let's introduce possibilities, but there are possible events and uh, whether an event can be the cause of another and therefore whether a system located at a particular event in space-time is uh, could be the cause of another or not is just a statement about the geometry of the world uh, and uh, the geometry of space and time. You know, whether if, if, if I can send the signal to you or not, uh, then I could be the cause of your uh, uh, data behavior or not. Uh, that's it. I mean, you know, cause-effects relations are, you know, results of interactions. And uh, where the possibilities of these cause-effect relations are there in the world. They are part of the geometry of space-time. And we leave aside any issue with quantum gravity and, and complications of, of, of the story. But that's, it's objective. I mean, yeah. Because that it is there, it's out there. Okay, good. Um, this is so. This is the kind of thing that's annoying to physicists, but it is the place where where reflecting on your concepts is really helpful and doing a bit of analysis. So, um, the notion of causation um, that that you're using is perfectly well defined. You can use the notion of cause to talk about spatiotemporal structure that tells you whether two things are connected in a way that allows you to send a signal from one to the other. When physicists use the notion of causal structure, very often that's exactly what they mean. It's a perfectly well-defined notion. There are implications built into the everyday no notion of cause that um, are very different from that, in particular, and the one that a lot of people have uh, focused on, is the asymmetry. So there's nothing in the notion of connectable by a causal signal, nothing built into the spatiotemporal geometry that you think of as the embodiment of causal structure when you're thinking in classical terms, that incorporates an asymmetry, nothing that tells you that this thing is the cause and that one is the effect even though when you think about it, because you have causal ideas barred from everyday common sense, you are thinking, probably importing into that um, uh, an asymmetry in, uh, tacitly. 
But let's start with that sort of notion that's built into the geometry. Now, one of the things that people noticed, and one of the things that started the philosophical discussion of causation and its relation to physics early in the 20th century, was the observation that actually, even when we look at the fundamental laws of classical mechanics, we don't find an asymmetry. So the laws are time uh, symmetric, which means that if you've got a process, very roughly, but if you have a process, very roughly, but in a way that can be made more precise. You know, if you have a process that takes you from state A to state B, then there's a physically possible process that takes you from state B to state A. So what that mean, what that suggested to people was not only is there no kind of asymmetry of determination built into the spatiotemporal structure, there's no asymmetry of, um, of determination built into the fundamental physical law. But people think if there's anything about the notion of causation, is that it incorporates an intrinsic asymmetry. If you say that A causes B, that's different from saying that B causes A. And so it raised the question of where and how do we extract from looking at physics in a classical setting um, at uh, a notion of causation that will capture or relate to this everyday idea that there's an asymmetry of determination. When you think about the everyday notion of cause, and it is arguably the most fundamental and the most the earliest in kind of development of our inter of our interaction with the world, the notion of cause is argument arguably the most fundamental. Like babies, as soon as they're out of the crib, are doing it causal exploration. They're seeing if I do this, what happens over there? They're bringing things about in the world. They're pulling and pushing and yanking. So conceptually, causation is arguably a very basic concept, basic to our understanding of the world. And the question that people, uh, the philosophical question about where are the causes um, is an attempt to understand how that notion of causation the one where if you say A causes B, then you're thinking A brings about B. Where does that get? How do we extract that from physics? It's not in the geometry. It's not fundamental laws. Where is it? How does it get started? So if notions of agency enter, it's partly hermeneutically trying to understand um, where and how we can find something that answers to those sorts of intuitions, A bringing about B. Mm -hmm. So, but this is uh, this bringing about uh, is more than temporal precedence. I mean, it's not just a, a temporal asymmetry. There's, there, it's, it's a more loaded notion. It's, it's a richer yeah. notion. So somehow the agency or whatever brings about the notion of cause and effect or is uh, it brings about more than just uh, identifying a temporal uh, asymmetry. So it's it's. Uh, well, so what... here's the challenge. So we start with this concept that we have, you know, that's that's more than just intuitions. It's built into our understanding of the world. Um, that does seem to have this. We're going to call it bringing about. It has a kind of oomphy direction of determination built into it. Conceptually and phenomenologically, it's rooted in things like the experience of pulling and pushing and yanking. So we have this idea, this in, this this loaded idea that seems to involve interaction with the world. Um, and on the other hand, we have the physics, and we're trying to understand how do we bring this idea together with that. And you know, it, it's. So we want us we want to to understand in in an articulated way where this fully umfi idea comes from and how it relates to the physics. And part of the question is, you know, we have a coupled exchange between an agent embedded in an environment where we think the environment is described at the fundamental level by geometry and material processes described by laws. And we want to understand in detail in a way that we can t connect all of the dots between the fundamental physics and the agent interacting with the environment and understand how and in what forms um, uh, uh, asymmetries 
arise. So one way to do that is to start with just what I called before the external infrastructure in the environment. So we have the, you know, the natural way to kind of recover the whole um, set of processes is you start with the phys- the the geometry, you put in the laws, you add an entropic gradient, you get you know macroscopic processes um, that obey the laws of thermodynamics. And you can do all of that before you ever introduce an agent. But now you introduce agents and agents are doing things like processing information and using that information to guide um, their actions. And now you have a bit more structure where you can start to understand how the sort of coupled exchange between an agent and an environment where the agent is getting information, using that information to 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 guide their motor behavior that they're thinking of as internally initiated, you know, kind of interventions on the environment. So they're thinking that the the you know my pulling and my pushing that's coming from me. Um, you can begin to see how to recover that full, robust notion of of causation. You don't need to make so the reason, you know, when you first said, "Oh, but I have a notion of cause that has nothing to do with agency." I can say, "Of course you do." You know, you can introduce no richer notions of causation. You know, at every level of that hierarchy, the geometric notions are perfectly well defined. They don't have an asymmetry built into them. You can get, you know, once you have thermodynamics in there, you can get, you know, asymmetries that are more robust and that do have a direction of determination. And you can get something much richer and much more closely associated with the phenomenology um, when you have agents in there. And I don't think you need to make choices, but where are the causes really? I mean, to, some extent, to-, to some extent, it's a matter of honesty, right? Intellectual honesty, that we should be honest with ourselves and, and, uh, uh, you know, openly accept uh, uh, that uh, when we talk and think about causes and effects, we do mean much more than just uh, you know causal relations in terms of light cones in uh, in space time. I mean, it's a uh, we do mean much more than we can strip out a lot of uh, details and aspects of this rich notion of causation and you no. Know, then we can boil everything down to to, to signal propagation in, in space time, and that remnant is captured by you know relativity and physical theories. But uh, you know it's it's a particular simplified uh, model of uh, of the richer notion of causality of in, in, in. Or it's I mean I think of it you know sometimes we mean more. And it's important to do that kind of analysis because you also don't want you don't want to be importing calls those richer causal intuitions into the understanding of, for example, you know, when you're using causal notions in physics or you're using causal notions to describe physical laws or something. I mean, it's you know, you don't always have to be interested in the richer notion, um, but you should be careful about um, understanding when and where the richer notions are appropriate and what sorts of inferences um, are brought to bear when you're using causal notions to make sure they're supported by the setting in which you're you're making those inferences. Okay, so maybe it's not so much or not just uh, honesty, it's also a matter of humility. That we should realize that the world uh, and even our conceptual world, I mean, uh, is much more complex uh, than uh, any specific model we use. Uh, and so we have to be careful of uh, uh, the type of model we, 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 we want to apply to, to, to the world. And at some point, you know, the model given by fundamental physics and relativity would be all we need uh, for, for, for going about uh, causality and so on. In other cases, we need to bring in a more complex uh, model of uh, causal relations uh, and in some cases we really have to take the full story into account and that where we include also agency and uh, all, all of that is that is that a way to phrase it that's right and also i mean i think and this connects maybe to some of the other notions of agency um we should be careful too that you know when when 
we look at physics and we say we don't see anything in there that has an asymmetry, you know, in the, at the fundamental level and so on. That shows that our causal notions are illusory. So that's also a move that some people have made. That was, you know, what Bertrand Russell said, for example, he said, oh, causal notions are, you know, folk notions that should be pushed away with the advancing tides of science to be replaced with, you know, notions of physical law. And that's not right either. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we need to understand which notions are, are um, important in which contexts and to distinguish them and to understand the relationships between them. That's a bit of uh, the typical, I can say it because I'm a physicist, but that's a bit of the typical physicist arrogance and fundamentalism that uh, if something doesn't appear in whatever physical theory I decide is the fundamental description of the world, uh, then it doesn't exist. And, and or, or it's, it's not fundamental, it plays no real role in the, in, in the world. It's, uh, yeah, we it's do, not real. Uh, yeah, it's not real. We use it all the time, but somehow we are we are mistaken, we're always mistaken, we've always been mistaken. Uh, right. Now I come as a physicist and tells you what the world really looks like, and and usually when you remove all these notions, it, it, it's pretty boring, or, or, it, or it's not necessarily more interesting uh, from that point of view. Okay, at some point I wanted to talk about uh, laws of nature and so on, but I mean, the, the, let's, let's keep that, uh, because what you said seems to be... Uh, um, Directly pointing to another instance of uh, uh, of a similar, you know, uh, apparent mismatch uh, of what you know the fundamental physics uh, seem to say and and uh, what our common sense uh, seems to say, uh, and the clash uh, may actually be due just to us, uh, you know, doing some sort of uh, application mistake. We 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 know we we try to apply some notion where where a richer one would be needed and uh, and I'm I'm referring to the the problem of free will. Now, uh I'm a physicist so normally I would uh, pretend I never thought about it and 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 that I had nothing to say about that and that uh, um, and and that I, I will happily leave that to philosophers. But and so now I have a philosopher in front uh, and so, uh, the, let me first give a naive definition of what, what the problem of free will is uh, as a physicist, uh, and then you enrich it with proper uh, with proper concepts and proper understanding. So the, the clash is that uh, I think that I'm deciding now to hold this bottle and put it somewhere else, uh, and I'm doing that freely, uh, that I could have done otherwise. I couldn't make a different decision and acted otherwise uh, in, in my physical uh, world. On the other hand, I look at my physical model of the world, and uh, I can be idealized with a spherical uh, point, and <laughs> this interacting with some other spherical system, which is the bottle, and uh, we interacted. There is some mechanical law of uh, governing our interaction, say Newton's uh, mechanics, uh, Newtonian mechanics, uh, forget about the refinements that don't really change too much the, 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 the problem. Mm -hmm. And and I find them nowhere where my free will uh, is hidden or, or described. I mean, the world is deterministic. So whatever, as a physical system, whatever I had to do because of my initial conditions, uh, I did it. And I evolved accordingly after interaction with the bottle uh, in my final conditions. And uh, and the world is deterministic, so there's no room for anything like uh, choices and and will and and freedom. Uh, that's the challenge. Uh, and you have a beautiful solution, I know, because you 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 sent me your book as a gift, and I read it, and I really enjoyed <laughs> it uh, so much. So I know you have a solution. And I even uh, thought I understood it, but I leave it to you to explain it. So, I mean, I should say I don't know that I have a solution. I mean, I think the way that I think of the reason, so the reason um, I focus on the problem is because I think it's beautiful and incredibly hard. I mean, I think, you know, the, the in physics, you know, very often people are attracted to problems kind of at the fundamental level or the frontiers of science where there are things that we don't understand. So, you know, they're and they're interested in dark matter or quantum gravity or they're interested in um but but for 
they don't realize that some of the real mysteries um, are right at the human level. So, if so, I the reason that the problem is so interesting to me because it's not just our intuitions about things. Is if you take seriously physics, and I do. I mean, I think I think yeah, it's our best way of understanding the world. It's so powerful in so many ways, but I, very hard to reconcile with my direct experience of myself as an agent. I mean, just it's the the most basic clash of I can't believe that when I'm making a decision about whether to raise my hand, what to say in the next section, in in the next section. It doesn't come down to the here and now. I mean, I'm it's it's really taking very seriously the idea that physics is the real story and trying to make sense of your own experience in that context. The way that the problem is very often raised in a philosophical discussion is a little bit different than the one you said because people are usually thinking of, of um, they're thinking kind of cosmologically, so they have this Laplacean image where you know, this old image made famous by Laplace where he was talking about Eternian mechanics and he says, physics tells us if there were a super intelligent being that knew the positions and velocities of the all of the particles of which the universe was made at the, you know, the very first moment in time or take it back as long as you want, three billion years, 14 billion years, any time you choose, very long before you were ever a gleam in your mother's eye, um, certainly long before you know um, the particles of which you were made took the particular form that they're taking right now. So I'm I'm tracing it back to you know you talked about your own initial conditions. I'm tracing it back to long before you were ever um, any being that knew the positions and momentums of, par of a particle back at that initial moment of time um, would be able to calculate what socks you'll wear right now, what time you'll you know, the, the moment of your death, but but more particularly the thoughts that will form in your head over the whole course of your life, the people that you love, the, the things that you think are you're doing in the very moment. Or you've got a difficult decision to make. You go to bed and you toss and turn all night, you know, and and you you go one way and then another and you're wrenching your heart out trying to figure it out. The laws of physics say everything that's going to happen over the course of that night and what you ultimately decide in the morning was decided long before you ever put your sweet head down on the pillow. So that's the problem. How do you reconcile your own experience of things coming down and hap you know, coming down to the here and now, happening as you toss and turn with this idea that it was actually set long ago? Where's the spontaneity? Where's the contingency? Where's the you doing anything at all? Um, that's the way that problem is usually arisen. So it's this kind of, you know, much more God's eye point of view. And then the clash between your embedded perspective. Philosophically, a lot of people think of the solution to the problem as being one of reconciling your kind of pre-theoretic intuitions about your own decisions with the physics. Um, I think of it much more kind of hermeneutically. Like, how do I understand myself? What does the physics actually say about me and what's going on in me over the course of the night? And how do I reconcile that um, with this Laplacian vision? The way that I approach it is much more, let's actually look at what the physics says. Um, the first thing you notice when, and this isn't in the book, this is something that's become kind of more, you know, I, digging a little bit more around the edges of the problem, because, partly because I don't think, I mean, I think it's much more interesting than a simple solution. I think it's 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 much more forcing us in the way that, for example, quantum mechanics forces us to come to grips with, to raise questions about our most fundamental sort of ideas. So what do we mean by decision anyways? What do we mean by, but one of the things that will point, that will sort of um, pop out at you immediately in the way that I raised the problem was that Laplacian, you know, vision really depends very much on a pre-relativistic notion of time, like the idea that there was an initial moment, um, you know, where all of the information that you actually need to do the calculation 
that would predict, you know, what I do even three seconds from now. Um, actually, relativity tells us there was no such initial moment. And the amount of information, the information that I would need to figure out, to calculate using deterministic laws, um, what I will do a minute from now is not contained in my past light cone. Indeed, it's not contained in the past light cone of any moment before the pre event that I'm trying to predict. Mm -hmm. So right out of the gate, you're saying, okay, now we have to really rethink notions of time in a way that physics itself has taught us we, we need to rethink notions of time. And can we resurrect the problem? You know, taking that seriously. Well, let's try to do that. So now you're sort of getting rid of this Laplacian vision where the universe started, you know, um, started, um, you know, from some initial moment where all of the facts that would need it be needed to predict using the laws as future. Um, we've gotten rid of that. So what do we do? We've got a more local picture. We have now a relativistic vision of the universe. There's no unfolding of the universe as a whole. There's situated systems located in volumes of space-time. And those systems are, although we don't have global notions of temporal evolution, we have the more local notions. So there I am, you know, um, like you said, you know, there's my initial state, say, when I'm lying down to make a decision on a dark night of the soul. Um, and I'm trying to to figure out what's going to happen over the course of the night. Is my decision kind of predetermined? Actually, it's not. You know, it's not predetermined by my past at the moment I lie down. It's predetermined as a matter of physical law for taking deterministic physics. So what do I need to know in order to know what's going to happen in the morning? I need to know what my initial state is and everything that could possibly impinge on me over the course of the night. And what does the process inside me look like? It's me going through, you know, kind of thoughts and having a back and forth. And I think, I mean, it's too complex a problem, you know, for us to sort of describe fully right now. But the but the kind of contours of, of what I want to say about it is actually when you reconstruct the physics, I mean, in, in, in realistic terms of what physics tells us about that, it's, it's not that far from what common sense thinks. First, at the beginning of that night, um, you're taking your physical state for granted, including the state of your brain. Now, the state of your brain is the product of a whole life where you've built up a bunch of memories and priorities and and beliefs and and all of that stuff is going to get brought to bear over the course of your night, of the night, on your decision about what to do. And mm. To me, that seems like you making a decision. That seems like you being the thing that makes it the case that whatever the decision is made, uh, that seems like exactly what you'd want when you say, "I want to know that it's up to me." Nothing outside you is going to determine what the decision is. It takes your brain and all of the memories and beliefs that you've built up over the course of your life. You're the part of the world. Nothing outside of you that's, that's making that happen. Let me say, if I understand it. So once more, it seems to be that we're, the problem of free will, as I naively stated, but also in the cosmological broader sense in which you, language in which you stated, uh, seems to be the result of uh, um an oversimplification, first of all, and uh, and and um, uh, and not taking into account uh, the again the richness of, of what what I should call uh, a model of myself and 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 myself, in fact, as a situated uh, physical system inside the world, and 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 what I mean by choosing and 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 uh, determining one course of action rather than another. And that somehow at the very moment, uh, it seems to me that what you're suggesting is at the very moment I use the physics not in a simplified uh, way, in just some, the simplest model of physics uh, that I can think of, and I pretend it's enough to understand my actions, but the, the richest physical modeling of myself in the world uh, making decisions, or at least apparently making de decisions, 
you're you're suggesting that uh, all this added structure will, uh, even if it is deterministically uh, uh, putting me on one course of action rather than another, will be exactly what I would call choosing or you know uh, myself well, choosing something or uh, and it's a little more yeah i mean it's a little more complex can you say even if the world is putting you on one course rather than another i think you you need to take so there's no question this changes and forces us to have a more articulated conception of ourselves so there's no sense in which it's really you know just underwriting your pre-theoretic intuition so but but it does i mean it's it's it, it's not the world that puts you onto one course rather than another. You have to take seriously the idea that the physics makes you absolutely essential and integral to the world going on one course okay. rather than another. So you also need to, and this is another part of the problem of free will, is people will think of themselves, and we very often do, as a kind of an indivisible locus of mental life distinct from brain and body. We look at the world, and all we see is our bodies, and we see the particles of the bodies, uh, uh, particles of which our bodies are made up, and we think that those are governed by fundamental physical laws. So, where do I get in there? You have to take very seriously that no, I am a particular configuration of matter, and the way that my body is configured is not it's not that the way my body moves is so much just due to the the you know what my part the particles that make me out move, it's, it's rather that biology has kind of hacked physics to use the behaviors of fundamental particles to put them into a configuration that's going to produce a certain kind of emergent behavior. I am a certain organization, and what I do is the product of this emergent organization that involves thinking and choosing, and I have been designed my body has been configured to use the physics that governs those particles to put them into a constrained figura configuration where they're going to do things like think and choose. Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking and choosing, I have to think, uh, looking down at physics, I am not something distinct from the physics. I am an embodied being that does things like thinks and chooses, and part of what I do if I'm looking at the physics is I move matter in space or you know, I move matter around space. You know, you don't get you don't get the physics without getting me. And moreover, I mean, you know, I think this is one of also one of the ways and that's partly implicit in the way that you and I were talking, so I want to correct it because it's important to the way it's not it's not just that we take the physics for granted and think that agencyism, you know, is we have to understand how it fits in is we don't because thinking beings because intelligent activity moves matter we need to in order to understand the physics of the bias of our world and our environment we need to really understand how intelligent activity fits in if you were just looking at the fundamental equations there oughtn't to be bridges. There oughtn't to be big hunks of matter fly of metal flying around, right? It's you need to understand how intelligent activity, which is itself emergent as a product of you know biology and the emergence of cognition and stuff. How, but it gets you know how how it gets in and starts interacting with matter in ways uh, that we need to explain why the matter that that um you know that we're surrounded with has the configurations that it does so so i think cognition and intelligence is part of physics that's that's great so let let me let let her all uh close this bit with the with the with the just an, um, a call to action to 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 everyone who is listening to 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 recognize and embrace the fact that they are intelligent uh, agents and that uh, they, they they not only they are part of the world uh, um, but they, they 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 I mean the world needs them as intelligent agents uh, and and uh, in in its in its very laws. And it's very, you know, working. 
Um, uh, would you would you subscribe to that? As absolutely, absolutely. But only the biosphere. I mean, from a cosmic perspective, you know, the the weirdness of matter around us. Um, it, you know, and it, so it's really the physics of the biosphere requires the understanding of, of intelligence because we do things that matter except in the particular weird configurations um, that we have organized doesn't do on its own. That's, that's great. Okay, so let's say let, uh, my feeling now is, is that uh, I, I've used my agency appropriately and that I, I ended up being a little bit more intelligent after talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Janan. Okay, take care. Ciao.